Good morning and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. Today, Ronnie is out on assignment. She is out today and it'll just be me in the studio. But nonetheless, we'll continue to bring you the latest news and information from around Greater West Bloomfield, Oakland County, and the state of Michigan regarding COVID-19 and other top stories in the area as well. As, as you, if you're tuning in for the first time, this is the Oakland County Megacast. We began in the midst of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic back in March. And each and every day from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, we will be bringing you the latest information, of course, about COVID-19 but additionally about other top stories in the local area as well. And we will be speaking with a number of distinguished guests and interesting people from around the community on top of that uh, during the show to get more in-depth information about what's going on in our communities, what's going on with COVID-19, and what information you need to know from these sources in long form interviews too. This isn't like a news show, a typical news show on television or even on radio where you get a couple minutes, maybe five minutes total. We, ha we go extensively with the people that we're talking to. And man, do we have a great lineup today as well. Uh, broadcasting on Civic Center TV, on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99. Online on civiccentertv.com. Just click on our watch live link or hit play in our player right on the home page to your right now. Circle it for those of you on the television side right now who want to watch online at some point later on. Or you can listen to us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM and live streaming online, including on your phone, on lakesfm.com if you're not able to listen to us over the traditional airwaves. In addition, we broadcast each and every day with a Facebook partner via Facebook Live. And today, we are pleased to be joined once again by our good friends over at West Bloomfield Parks. And you can follow them, facebook.com slash WB Park. So we give you plenty of places to watch and listen to this, the Oakland County Megacast, each and every day of the week so that you can get the most up-to-date information from your hometown. And another place that you can do that is on our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, where we have the top news stories for each and every day. We update this on the daily. Today, one of our top stories, entrepreneurs targeted by a new small business loan program. Huntington announced this week that it is launching a new program, the Huntington Lift Local Business Businesses program that will offer loans to small businesses that have suffered financial hardships as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The loans expected to range from about $1,000 to $5,000 or micro loans on the low end to upwards of $150,000 may enable struggling startups to continue business despite the toll of the past seven months of the pandemic or inspire new entrepreneurs to invest in their ideas and kickstart a great idea or budding business that has been waiting for a spark. Those that are interested in applying for these loans will qualify with a FICO score of as low as 580 or higher. And the loans will also have repayment options that will be flexible and long-term. So Huntington Bank, Bank uh, announcing this new small business loan program that's definitely going to be a help for a lot of these small businesses that have been continuing to look for relief. Maybe they took the PPP loans, maybe they have taken some loans through Oakland County or gotten grants through Oakland County and other programs that have gone on, but they're still looking for that relief. This has gone on for seven months and counting, and it doesn't look like there's any further relief in the form of the end of the COVID-19 pandemic or even additional relief from the federal government coming anytime soon. So these loans, can't, these loan opportunities not coming soon enough, but are definitely welcomed by these businesses. So Huntington's new Lift Local Businesses program uh, that will provide small business loans to entrepreneurs and other small companies that have been continuing to struggle financially or taking a toll financially from this COVID-19 pandemic. That and more, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Our next story, Michigan over the weekend recorded nearly 3,000 new COVID-19 cases. On Monday, Michigan health officials reported 2,909 new cases and over 21 deaths from COVID-19. Moving the state of Michigan's daily new cases average to its, to its highest point since early April. While Michigan's testing numbers have remained about the same, about 30,000 tests per day, the positive rate has risen as of late, reaching about 4% 
last week with the state's fatality rate from COVID-19 being at about 4.8%. As of Monday's updated numbers, the state of Michigan has reported a total of 147,086 cases of the novel coronavirus with 7,031 deaths. So as Ronnie and I talked about yesterday, that positivity rate with with regards to these COVID-19 tests continues to be on the rise. We've spoken previously that if you're under 3%, you're in about the safe range where community spread isn't happening. But we're approaching the community spread point right now as we're now rising and we're in the 4%, fourth percentile and, it, and cases continue to be on an uptick. Now, that's nearly 3,000 new cases. Shouldn't really be all that alarming because the state government has discontinued to an discontinued announcing COVID-19 cases over the weekend. They are releasing those numbers instead on Monday. So that 2,909 new cases is between both Saturday and Sunday's numbers. It is not a single day reporting. That is not a major spike. However, our numbers in the state of Michigan, our daily test numbers continue, uh, test numbers, t testing positive continue to be on the rise. Other stories at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. COVID-19 cases, so COVID-19 causes fewer drivers to be on Michigan roads, but traffic deaths are increasing. Interesting. Over the past seven months and counting of the COVID-19 pandemic, workers have remained at home, schools have been closed, and most public places have either been open at a reduced capacity or have been shut down altogether. This has led to fewer commutes and fewer non-essential trips outside of the home and therefore fewer cars, cars on Michigan streets in 2020. Despite the reduced overall traffic and even fewer crashes, the Detroit Free Press's Nisa Khan reports that according to Michigan State Police, 2020 has brought upon more vehicle-related deaths to date than the same period up to this point in 2019. Among the potential culprits of increased death tolls on the road are speeding, tailgating, and not wearing seatbelts. There have been 12 more deaths between January 1, 2020 and September 20th, 2020 than that same time period in 2019. And this trend could continue to inflate even greater without precautions being taken by Michigan drivers soon. That's a great article from Nisa Khan in the Detroit Free Press that we have posted on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, where yes, there's less cars on the road, but people are taking the liberty to make their commutes a little bit shorter by maybe going a little bit over the speed or excessively over the speed because there aren't as many cars on the road. It seems to be less of a risk to do that, but it is just as much of a risk. You're going at those highest speeds. It's easier for you to lose control of your vehicle. Definitely, if you end up making contact with someone else's vehicle, uh, it becomes even more dangerous than it was at that lower speed. And if you are in a position where maybe you aren't making contact with someone else's vehicle at the increased speed, but you're impeding their ability to drive and they have to take evasive action, they could also be in danger and that could cause, of, of course, a mounting danger as well. Tailgating, of course, an easy way to get yourself brake checked or have a sudden stop happen and end up in an accident and then not wearing your seatbelt. If you do get in an accident, you are much more likely to be injured or killed by not wearing your seatbelt. That's why it is a law to wear your seatbelt in the state of Michigan. So uh, while there are less cars on the road, we're seeing those deaths increase. And yes, that's that period between January 1st and September 20th this year only saw 12 more deaths than that period last year. But keep in mind, at this time, during that time period last year, and even at this time last year, we were still in a normal state of living. Everybody was going that, that was going to work was going into the office. People were driving regularly to go for recreational purposes around town and around the state, for travel purposes, for work purposes, dropping their kids off at school, picking them up. So there's even more reason for traffic to be out in 2019 during that time than there is right now, which is why it's only a 12 death increase, but that's still a significant number. And the state police are saying it's gonna continue to rise if precautions aren't being taken by drivers on the road promptly. Lastly, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, the great sovereign nation of Canada continues its non-essential U.S. travel ban through November. Canada has elected once again to extend its moratorium on the non-essential travel across the U.S. border as COVID-19 prolongs itself beyond the seventh month mark. 
The Canadian border will remain closed to such non-essential travel through November 21st, as was announced on Monday, October 19th, by the Canadian Public Safety Minister, Bill Blair. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, in a recent interview on the radio, not on this station, of course, although we'd love to have Mr. Trudeau on, indicated his desire to keep the border closed until the pandemic is under control, as was written by Bloomberg's Kate Bolangaro. Canada's travel restrictions on the undefended border, the longest undefended border uh, in the world, to the United States began in March as the pandemic began to amount on a global scale, especially in North America. Although non-essential travel remains banned for the time being, Canada does permit some necessary travel between its neighbor to the south for essential commerce, among other instances. So no surprise, Canada keeping its borders closed. Actually, I read a really interesting article about a, an island that's just off of the coast of Washington State, in between Washington and Canada, that a lot of Canadians travel to. It's, it's kind of like what Kego Harbor and Sylvan Lake were years and years ago when they were a travel destination for cottages for people that were coming up from Detroit. Similar situation, except this is an island. Canadians travel to that island, which is technically a part of the United States. And this article that I read yesterday, we don't have it posted on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus because it doesn't really have anything to do with Oakland County. But it was interesting, and this makes me think of that because the, the article presented the case that maybe Canada should consider buying this island from the United States because so many Canadians travel there to their winter getaways and are frustrated that they can't go over there and winterize their homes before the season gets cold and potentially could do some damage. So this travel ban not just affecting Americans, also affecting Canadians that travel back and forth for non-business purposes and those that have to come across the border for business purposes, for essential business, are of course still permitted under certain guidelines. That story and more on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. In addition to our daily tough stories, you can find additional resources from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the state of Michigan, right here in Oakland County, and even your local municipalities, including West Bloomfield Township's direct COVID-19 page, Kiko Harbor's COVID-19 page, City of Rochester, City of Troy, even our friends over in Auburn Hills. You just click on these links. Let's say I'm in West Bloomfield Township. I'm a West Bloomfield Township resident. I want to learn more about COVID-19 in West Bloomfield. You just go to our website, click on that link. You don't have to dig through West Bloomfield's uh, own website to get to, to that page. We take you straight to the source. CivicCenterTV.com slash coronavirus. In addition, if you are tuning in a little bit late or you have to tune out at some point, go off to work, go pick your kids up from school, whatever you got to do. And you miss part of our show, CivicCenterTV.com slash megacast. We have full episodes, short clips, and you can watch entire interviews as well on demand. Those are usually up on our page at or before 5 p.m. on the daily civiccentertv.com, your home for the latest COVID-19 and other news in the local area. I'm Tyler Keith. We're going to take a quick break. we got a great show ahead for you in just a few minutes. I'll be speaking with uh, an official from the Detroit Public Library. We'll also be speaking to uh, the Michigan Peddler. You've probably seen this man, Mike Gill's business, peddling around the downtown Detroit area with those that are having a nice cocktail with some friends. We'll talk We'll continue to talk Detroit, the Detroit Jazz Festival. We'll have a guest join us from them. Uh, we'll also get an update on how history during this time is being recorded from Toby Vaught over at the Michigan History Center. And then we'll kick off, we'll cap off the show today uh, going to one of our great local parks, going to Belle Isle uh, and talking to the president of the Belle Isle Conservancy. That and more coming up. You're listening and watching to the Oakland County Megacast, Civic Center TV, civiccentertv.com, 89.3 Lakes FM, and the Facebook page of West Bloomfield Parks. This is the Oakland County Megacast. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes after this break. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19. 
to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. for the delay, I have uh, two identical mouses here, one for our radio computer and one for uh, the computer that I'm pulling up our Zoom on, and uh, I got a little confused between the two of them. Welcome back. I'm Tyler Keefe. You're listening and watching to the Oakland County Megacast. It's a one-person show today. Ronnie Dahl is, is out on assignment today. She will be returning with us tomorrow, and we uh, welcome her back, of course, and hope she has a wonderful Tuesday uh, away from the show. Uh, of course, you're watching us on Civic Center TV, listening to us on 89.3 Lakes FM, online on lakesfm.com. And, of course, today, our Facebook partner, the West Bloomfield Parks Department, and we, we thank them for joining us. You can go ahead and give them a like, facebook.com slash wbparks, as we uh, get ready to dive right into today's program and talk to a number of interesting guests, including our first guest today. She is the Public Relations Specialist at the Detroit Public Library. We're joined by Katie Dagovitz. She is joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Katie, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate having you on. How are you? How's the team over at the Detroit Public Library? We're doing well. Uh, we've been uh, open to the public for a few weeks now, and so far it's been going great. So having been closed, I, I would assume, up until this point. You said you've just been open a few weeks. How did the library continue to operate during the closure? A lot of libraries went, entire, went either entirely virtual or they had uh, scheduled pickups and returns and very strict policies for returning and then, of course, uh, giving back out those books and other materials as well. What did the Detroit Public Library do during its shutdown time to continue service to the people of Detroit in the greater area? Um, well, like most uh, public libraries and other organizations, we did shut our doors to the public uh, beginning uh, March 13th, and uh, we focused solely on our digital resources that we have available for our patrons. And so that meant offering uh, downloadable ebooks and audio books, streaming music and movies, all of our research databases, our uh, digital collections online and to, to really push and show that those are available to our, our customers. Uh, beginning in the summer, our mobile library got back out onto the road and started visiting community stops with uh, free giveaway books uh, for kids and uh, just trying to be out there into the community and let everyone know that we're still thinking about them and we're still trying to provide great service. In the summer, we also started the uh, reserved item pickup where you could reserve books online and then would receive a call to be able to come to the main library downtown and uh, pull up and then we our uh, staff would bring the book and put it in your car or trunk and then at the uh, end of september we started reopening our doors to the public at the moment we have the main library and six of our neighborhood branches open for limited service Kate, katie dagovitz with us she is the public relations specialist at the Detroit Public Library, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. And Katie, we've talked to a number of other libraries in, in Oakland County and in the Metro Detroit area over the last several months as some of them have reopened and some of them are still just getting to the point of reopening, much like the Detroit Public Library. 
has in just the last couple of weeks. So as they are reopening, and COVID-19 still is obviously a, a significant threat to the public health, how does the Detroit Library balance continuing its services, continuing to check out these books, check out these electronic materials, but do so safely and make sure that as they are bringing them back in and, and preparing them for being checked out by the public once again, that these items are safe and are cleaned uh, to prevent the spread of COVID-19? So first, a lot of our customers are going to definitely notice some changes in our service. One of those being that there is no more browsing uh, sh books on the shelf. In order to check anything out, you either have to log on to your account um, and request it that way or call the library at 313-481-1400. They'll be able to put your book on hold and you'll receive a phone call when your item is ready to pick up. Uh, once you have returned your books, all of the items will be quarantined uh, for a specific amount of time before being released to be put back on the shelf and checked out again. Uh, another one of our requirements is that masks must be worn in the buildings at all times. We have limits in terms of how many customers can come in at a time. And um, for one of our more important uh, aspects that we offer at the public library computer use, we have had to restrict the number of computers so that are available uh, to make sure that uh, customers are appropriately spaced apart, computers are being cleaned before and after customer use. And uh, because we know that this is gonna be kind of a hardship for a lot of our customers, we've uh, opened up the opportunity to reserve your computer online. So you can either call or you can go to our website. We have an option to reserve your computer slot for one hour. And uh, this will help so that you don't have to come in and wait. You can come at your appointed time, use the computer and, and know that everything is safe. We also now have available uh, for checkout laptops. So if you do come and there aren't available computers at the library, you are able to, with your Detroit Public Library card, check out a laptop and take it home and uh, use the technology in that fashion. Katie Dagovitz with us on the Oakland County Megacast. She is the public relations specialist at the Detroit Public Library with us today on the, pro on the program. Uh, we are broadcasting live on Civic Center TV on 89.3 Lakes FM and on the Facebook page of West Bloomfield Park. So, Katie, um, you mentioned some of the new, new services that are being put in place to help people either access access technology such as computers on site at the Detroit Public Library or check out uh, laptops and other devices. What other new initiatives and new technologies have been instituted either as a result of COVID-19 or as innovations during the shutdown that are now being put into common place in the library services? We also now have a new live chat feature on our website. So when you go to our website at DetroitPublicLibrary.org, uh, a chat box will pop up and we have librarians standing by uh, so you can interact with them in real time and they can uh, answer your questions right then and there. So you don't necessarily have to be in the library or if you are in the library and you're not comfortable coming up to the librarian at the reference desk. Uh, you can go ahead and type in your question and chat. If a librarian cur isn't currently online or with another customer at the moment, you can leave your contact information for that as well and they'll get back to you immediately. So we're just trying to create avenues and opportunities for our customers to still access the type of services and the resources and the help and assistance from our librarians without having to actually come to the reference desk or actually be in person at the library. Um, and another uh, op uh, opportunity we've just rolled out is that we know that only opening a limited num a number of branches is an inconvenience to a lot of the neighborhoods. So our mobile library has a specific schedule where they're going to be visiting eight of our closed branches over the course of uh, on a weekly schedule and they'll be sitting outside the closed branches for two hours at a time. And that way, if you're used to going to a particular branch, you still have the opportunity so you can request your items be picked up at the mobile library. And when the mobile library is in your neighborhood, you can go ahead and uh, get those items from them. The mobile library, in addition to holds pickup, will also have access to free Wi-Fi. You can also check out a laptop for one hour. There'll be giveaway books for kids and adults. 
and um, just a way to that we can continue to bring service to areas that a branch might not be open at the moment. Katie Dagovitz with us. She is from the Detroit Public Library, their public relations specialist joining us on the program today. Katie, um, is the Detroit Public Library, are the services available just to the people of Detroit? Can people come in from outside and, and interact with the Detroit Public Library, check out materials and so on? Well, to get a Detroit Public Library card, you need to be a resident of Detroit or Highland Park. Um, at the moment, because we know it's difficult for residents of the city to come into the library, we're offering a digital only card. So if you uh, go to our website and apply for a library card online, you'll receive a, a card that will provide you with access to our digital services. And this will allow you to um, access uh, our databases as well as stream music and news, movies through uh, Hoopla or download eBooks on Overdrive. Um, if you need a traditional card to use the computer, you'll still have to come into our branches. Um, but for those who aren't residents of Detroit, we're going to be continually working and incre increasing uh, online programs and uh, events uh, virtually so that anyone can take part of those. At the moment, we have uh, creative writing courses and journaling courses and uh, we're starting book clubs and those are for anyone who's interested in participating uh, in an online environment. And you can find those uh, events on our website. And it most likely just requires you to register so you can get the, uh, the link for when the online program takes place. And uh, those are available for, for anyone, not necessarily those holding a library card. Katie Dagovitz with us, the public relations specialist at the Detroit Public Library, joining us on the Megacast on 89.3 Lakes FM, on Civic Center TV, and on the Facebook page of West Bloomfield Parks. In addition, as always, we are on Birmingham Area Municipal Access, also on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99 in their community television programming guide. Uh, Katie, as we continue on, through the COVID-19 pandemic and a lot of kids are learning in a virtual method or through a hybrid method. Is the library providing a service to local schools or local students in the Detroit, in Detroit and in the Detroit area to help them through this difficult time with either additional educational resources or maybe even some help accessing technology like you had mentioned, the computer, the computer and laptop checkout? Right, so our children's librarians are working with the teachers in the Detroit public schools um, to make sure that all students at least have a digital library card so they can access what they need to online um, and therefore be able to uh, use our databases to do research uh, for their projects or their papers. And um, We've always had a great relationship with the Detroit Public Schools, and so this is just going to to further it to help and offer whatever we can to all of the students who are doing distance learning. Um, and we know it's different because the kids kids can't come to necessarily to the library anymore. And we used to have a lot of great programs and story times at the library, but our children's librarians have been uh, recording their own story times and we've been posting them on our Facebook page and YouTube channel and sharing them via social media. So since there's not necessarily the in-person story time, we're offering that virtually. Uh, in addition, uh, Project Art in Detroit is doing uh, virtual art classes, but we have bags of arts, crafts, and supplies at the library that once you've registered for those programs, you can come up and to the library and pick up your art supplies and then work on the projects virtually uh, during the year. Katie Dagovitz with us. She is the public relations specialist over at the Detroit Public Library, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Katie, just a few more minutes with you, but, uh, but before we do let you go, I just want to ask if there's any further programs that, that are coming down the pike in the next several months that would be interesting for our audience to know about those that are listening from within Detroit or within surrounding areas that may be open uh, to the public or something interesting that might catch somebody's eye that we should be aware of and mark our calendars for as well. Um. I don't have anything necessarily for you to mark your calendar for. I guess the best source for uh, people to find out information of what's going on is our website. And we have uh, 
a page devoted to the different events that are taking place. And so we just um, opened our doors. We're still uh, testing the waters of what our customers uh, are interested or looking for in, in a virtual and online environment. And so we'll definitely be expanding uh, our book clubs as, as well as those types of programs. But uh, if something big uh, does come up, I will definitely let you know. But at the moment, it's just um, trying to offer our traditional uh, library services in a, in a different and limited type of, of environment and um, seeing how that works out and begin to expand and, and figure out where to go from there. Katie Dagovitz with us from the Detroit Public Library. Uh, anything else that would be important for our audience to know today or any other information that you'd like to uh, let, let us know about before we let you go today? Uh, just uh, for the most up-to-date information, definitely check out our website. We uh, will have our schedule for the mobile library visits as well as what's going on in the building. And be sure to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and we have a YouTube channel. And so a lot of our content, since it's being you know, created in a digital fashion, is now being, uh, that's really our, our main contact uh, with people to, to get the word out and to, to get them engaged and interested. So um, if you can take a look there and you can see what's going on and, and what's changing and what's happening. Well, Katie, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Appreciate having you on. Katie Dogovitz, the Public Relations Specialist at the Detroit Public Library, joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast. Appreciate having her on and appreciate the Detroit Public Library, of course, for joining us uh, today on the program. And if you have not gone out to the Detroit Public Library or gone out to your local library, we cannot suggest enough uh, that you definitely support them either either through their virtual programming or if you are comfortable and you can safely do so uh, by going in in person and visiting them. That would be excellent as well. The libraries provide such great services to the public. Yeah, people aren't necessarily checking out a whole lot of books anymore. They're not necessarily going to the libraries for access to technology as often as we used to in the past. I remember I used to go to the library all the time with my parents, with my grandparents as a kid right here uh, next door to us at Green Media Center over at the West Bloomfield Township Public Library at the at West Bloomfield Civic Center. And they, they provide such incredible services to the people of our community, and as do other libraries and other communities as well. So if you get a chance to support your local library, definitely go ahead and do that. They're excellent. We know our library here in West Bloomfield are excellent community partners. We know that the Detroit Public Library is an excellent community partner for Detroit and the metro area as well. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we will be moving on from the library to some recreational fun that you can also experience in Detroit. We'll be speaking to the owner of the Michigan Peddler. That coming up and more. You are watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations, Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 89.3 Lakes FM, and on the Facebook page of our good friends over at West Bloomfield Parks. We'll return after this. This is the Oakland County Megacast. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, Comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's gonna be who? And whether we wear green or blue. One thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. 
Our Test Locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs, even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary. We've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful, michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Kieft in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. In addition, we are on Birmingham Area Municipal Access on 89.3 Lakes FM, and we are also on the West Bloomfield Parks Facebook page via Facebook Live, and pleased to be joined by a number of interesting guests today, including Mike Gill. He is the owner of the Michigan Peddler, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast via telephone. Mike, thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Appreciate having you on. How's your team over at the Michigan Peddler been doing? Well, we've had a pretty busy summer given everything we've gone through and the summer's been great now we're into the fall and you know we'll slowly start ramping down as the weather turns so for those that aren't familiar what is the michigan peddler what service do you provide to the public sure so the michigan peddler is one of those if you've ever visited downtown detroit party bikes that goes around the city of detroit uh, you get on there with your friends or family you pedal around. Usually we'll stop and take a picture in front of uh, some place um, like the Spirit of Detroit, the Stevie Wonder mural, the train station out in Corktown or Comerica Park and the Tigers uh, to kind of make a memory that you can take with you. And then a lot of people choose to do a pub crawl where they'll make one or two stops at uh, various bars in the city. Um, and all throughout that time, you're pedaling around on the streets of Detroit, seeing you know great architecture and enjoying the outside. And does this run all throughout the year, or is this a seasonal service, Mike? Well, for some reason, we're a lot more popular in July than we are in January, uh, but we are a year-round business, so we do... Um, you know, bring people out on the bike. Uh, we do do a lot of rides over the holiday season um, when families, you know, traditionally get together in like Thanksgiving or Christmas season, um, and we'll take them out on the bike, um, and they'll have family get-togethers. They'll go around. They'll see the Christmas lights, the Christmas tree, and uh, kind of make it into a winter outing. Um, but obviously we're much more popular in the summer and fall months. Mike Gill, with, Mike Gill with us. He is the owner of the Michigan Peddler, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Mike, uh, as with every business and every service throughout the state of Michigan and even the United States, the COVID-19 pandemic certainly has taken a toll um, on those businesses in, in some capacity or another. How has your 2020 been compared to past seasons with COVID-19 having such a great impact on the state of Michigan, even throughout the summer months? 
Sure. I mean, it's obviously been a challenging year for anybody that has a small business, um, and uh, the Michigan Peddler was no exception to that. Uh, you know, our season starts up really right around St. Patrick's Day, and obviously that's right when Michigan really um, started to feel the effects of COVID-19. And so uh, while um, March and then April and May are, are times when our business builds we were you know locked in our garage with our bikes not operating um, and then in June we were able to open up uh, and we slowly started seeing our business come back um, the last couple months have been you know very strong months for us um, even in a normal year uh, as I think uh, families as well as friends kind of were looking for a way to to get together and do so in a safe way outdoors so our business was, you know, good in August and September and October. Um, and, you know, we made, obviously, uh, changes to the way we operate based on COVID-19. So we reduced the number of people we allow on our bikes. Um, we did simple things that most businesses have done, such as adding hand sanitizer. We've, you know, started disinfecting our bikes in a different way than we did in past years. So, you know, we took a lot of different precautions and, you know, um, the outdoors was probably the biggest thing that I think drew people to our bike in that they were, you know, able to experience a good time in open air. Mike, Mike Gill joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the owner of the Michigan Peddler joining us today on the program. So, uh, Mike, is this, a sing is this a single set business or how many bikes do you have in operation uh, throughout the metro Detroit area on a given day or, or throughout the year? Sure. So we are totally focused on the city of Detroit. All of our operations are based in the city of Detroit. We operate out of Corktown, and we have seven bikes total uh, as part of our fleet. So on any given day, if, uh, you know, if we're book solid, you can see up to seven of our bikes trailing uh, around the city of Detroit. Six of them are regular size bikes. And then last year we added a special bike to our fleet that we call the Mini Peddler. And it only seats six um, versus our regular bikes on a regular year would seat 15. So the Mini Peddler is for those when you can't put together a group of, you know, 12 to 15 people, but you want to go out. This is a a bike that you know it's good for couples to go out for an evening on the town or a f individual family to go out and experience detroit and it it operates the same way as our big bikes do but it's just for a smaller number mike gill with us he is the owner of the michigan peddler joining us today on the oakland county megacast civic center tv 89.3 lakes fm birmingham area municipal access and on the Facebook page of West Bloomfield Park. So, Mike, I have to ask because this is such an interesting uh, business, such an interesting business, and an interesting concept. I, I've done some work in the in downtown for uh, the company that I work for, Motown Digital. It's contracted in to run our operation here, and, and I've seen the Michigan Peddler c come by uh, as I'm driving out of the city or as I'm walking down the street uh, from place to place. Uh, downtown doing that work and it, it always catches my eye and it always and it always makes me think how did you come up with this idea what brought you to start this bu this business in this concept well we've been in business for five years now and it was simply uh, a friend of mine sent me an email with a picture of a bike like this that was operating in a different city and said have you ever seen anything like this and he was just kind of curious after he saw it and I replied, no, and it kind of got the wheels turning. And so I sat on the idea for a few years. And then um, in 2016, really the end of 2015, started thinking this would be something that I think would have great appeal in the city of Detroit. Um, you know, at the time, uh, Detroit was just starting its renaissance, seeing a lot of new restaurants, a lot of new bars, and seeing a lot of people that had not – come down to see Detroit all of a sudden wanting to go down and experience what, you know, the largest city in Michigan has to offer. So that was kind of uh, the way that um, I came about to getting the idea to start it. Uh, and then we uh, launched in the spring of 2016. 
Mike Gill with us. He is the owner of the Michigan Peddler, joining us on the Oakland County MegaCast. So, so Mike, I, I do also have. I'm also curious. Um, does do these rides revolve around alcohol and around bar stops, or is this something where you know mom and dad can come down to the city of Detroit with their with their kids and and just take a ride around the city in, in this open bike form, and maybe mom and dad ha have a cocktail or two, and the, and the kids enjoy the ride as well, or is this specifically just for adults? Yeah, it's exactly, um, the answer is yes and no. Um, we've had experiences for all types and all ages. Uh, so literally, we've had little kids on the bike with their family, um, without any alcohol. We've had 96-year-olds on our bike as part of a family reunion, uh, and we've had everything in between. So last a uh, couple weeks ago, we did a birthday party for a group of 13-year-olds. Um, the week before, we had a um, situation where a family went out on the bike, and it was a birthday party for, I believe it was a 12-year-old daughter, and her father had just passed away back in February, and so it was a way of kind of trying to get back out and celebrate for the first time a good memory after, you know, experiencing such a tough loss. Uh, we've done family reunions. We've done individual families. There's a lot of ways to do things that don't involve alcohol. Um, you know, we'll stop and get ice cream. We'll stop at places like Beacon Park or Campus Martius and let people walk around and see those places. Um, so we've had kids on the bike. We've had birthday parties for kids. We've had families go out as a family outing. Um, and then, as I spoke about earlier, you know, the most common thing is friends or family getting together for an adult night out um, in which, um, you know, beverages are involved, um, bar stops are involved, um, and, you know, a good time is had by all in that way. But we customize all of our rides based on what, you want to do during the two hours that you have the bike really interesting experience definitely definitely and, and a unique business idea mike gill joining us he is the owner of the michigan peddler joining us on the oakland county mega castle mike for those that this has piqued the interest they see this graphic we have up uh, with your picture down uh by the spirit of Detroit in front of one of your bikes, and, and they think, wow, this this is an interesting experience. Before it gets too cold, or even after it gets a little cold, I want to experience this in downtown Detroit. This sounds like a lot of fun. What is the typical experience like for people that do ride one of the Michigan Peddler bikes? Well, as you look at our reviews on Google or Facebook or Yelp or TripAdvisor, you know, we're highly, highly rated. We have about a 5.0 rating. Um, so I think people experience a good time. Uh, we start our rides in Corktown. You'll often uh, go through Corktown, and then people head into either Midtown or Downtown, um, and they'll spend the majority of their time on the bike, but we always like to include time to make a stop for a restroom um, break as well as picture breaks. And then if people want some kind of food or beverage, like an ice cream, um, a hot dog at Lafayette Coney, or you know, beers or other drinks at a bar, those are um, the things that usually incorporate the ride. Mike Gill joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the owner of the Michigan Peddler. We are broadcasting live on Comcast Channel 15 and on the AT&T nine, Channel 99 Public Access Community Government and Education Channel Guide on both Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access. In addition today, we are joined by our Facebook partner, West Bloomfield Parks, facebook.com slash WB Parks. Hey, if you have a question for Mike Gill, if you have a question for any other of our guests or just want to say something to your community, go ahead and, and put a comment on their live video, facebook.com slash West Bloom, WB Parks, facebook.com slash WB Parks. So, Mike, as, you're, as we're approaching the colder months of the year, yesterday was quite chilly and quite rainy, and it's definitely uh, trending that way going forward. How does the experience change, or how, do, how does your business operations change when you are in the colder weather months? What, uh, what is that experience like for you, for the, for the business, and for those riding as well as we're approaching those months of the year? But, of course, your business is still very much in operation. Correct. We run, you know, 12 months out of the year. Um, 
we run in the snow. Uh, our rules as far as the winter goes, if it's snowing and snow is accumulating, you know, we don't want to be out on the roads if it's unsafe. Um, either where we would be sliding around or someone could potentially slide into us. So we would cancel rides if that's occurring. But if we got five inches of snow yesterday and the roads are clear uh, and have, dry, have been cleaned off and are dry, you know, we'll keep running and we'll operate those rides. So people see the city of Detroit in, you know, a different way in the winter. Um, maybe those bar stops are a few minutes longer um, when they go inside to get warm. Uh, we recommend people, you know, bringing uh, foot warmers and, and uh, glove warmers if the weather is going to be significantly um, chilly. Uh, but we kind of keep our uh, playbook the same. You know, we'll go around, we'll take pictures, we'll experience uh, the holiday lights that are soon coming out. Um, we are having a Halloween costume coming up in, uh, over Halloween week that we'll be giving away a $100 gift certificate. Uh, to ride our bikes, as well as T-shirts and pint glasses to the group that comes out uh, most decked out in their holiday gear and has uh, the best assortment of costumes on that rides us on either Friday or Saturday, the 30th and 31st. So there's a lot of ways, um, you know, we still uh, use late October, November, and December uh, as ways to experience um, the outdoors, fun on the bike, and having a good time. Mike Gill joining us. He is the owner. <clears throat> my apologies. He is the owner of the Michigan Peddler. Joining us on the Oakland County MegaCast. Mike, just a few more minutes with with us today for those that are interested and want to find more information. Maybe even schedule a trip. Where can they get more information? How can they best get in contact with the Michigan Peddler? Sure, you can visit our website. Our website is Michigan Peddler, and make sure you spell Peddler correct. It's P E D A L. ER, like pedal a bike, dot com. Uh, you can check out our Facebook page, which uh, if you search Michigan Peddler on Facebook, you'll find it, but it's MI Peddler. Uh, and operators are standing by right now to take your call, 313-744-3272. Well, Mike, we appreciate having you on just another minute or so with you today. Uh, for uh, Is there any other information that would be important for us? Our audience to know about the Michigan Peddler or anything else, any other announcements you'd like to make about your business at this point in time? No, I mean, yeah, I think you did a great job just covering all the information about, uh, you know, what it's like to spend time on the Michigan Peddler. Um, we just think it's a great way, whether if um, people are interested in having, you know, drinks on the bike, because alcohol is allowed to you bring your own alcohol on the bike. Um, that's one group of people that have a great time uh, experiencing that, listening to music uh, while they pedal through the city. Uh, but also for people like we talked about that don't aren't looking for that kind of experience, it's a fabulous way to kind of slowly pedal through the city and see all the construction and renovation projects, um, old time architecture uh, that's in. Um, you know, the, the city that we all uh, know and love. Um, and we also, on our bikes, we have electric assist, which simply means you don't need to be Lance Armstrong to move the bike. We can do that for you. So you pedal as much or as little as you want, and we'll get you from point A to point B. Um, so it, it can be a physical outing um, with exercise if you want it to be, but it can also be a really a relaxing tour, having a good time with friends and family, um, without a whole lot of work, too, if, if that's the way you want it to be also. Well, Mike, we appreciate having you on. Thank you for being with us today. Great to have, be on your show. Thanks again for inviting me. Appreciate having you on. Mike Gill, the owner of the Michigan Peddler, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. So now if you're down in Detroit and, you're, and you see a bunch of people pedaling along on a, on a bike, having a good time, having a cocktail or two with, with friends and family and others, then uh, now you know who they are. Probably the Michigan Peddler and our good friend Mike Gale. We appreciate having him on the show today telling us about how he came up with this unique idea that we, that we see uh, in action each and every day downtown and uh, what makes this such a special 
uh, special idea unique to the state of Michigan and downtown Detroit. Downtown Detroit. So we appreciate having Mike on the show uh, and um, appreciate you for tuning in as well. Of course, we are broadcasting live on Civic Center TV on Comcast Channel 15 and on AT&T Channel 99. We are on the radio as always on 89.3 Lakes FM, live streaming online on lakesfm.com. We're also on Birmingham Area Municipal Access. That is just like Civic Center TV, on Comcast Channel 15, and on the AT&T Channel 99 Public Access Community and Government Television Guide as well. And today we're on the Facebook page of West Bloomfield Parks and appreciate them joining us on today's edition of the program. Hey, if you have a question for some of our guests, if you have a shout out you'd like to make to somebody in our community tuning in today, go ahead on the facebook.com slash WB Parks and comment on their live video of today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Hey, and if you just tune in at the tail end of Mike Gill's interview with us, you want to learn more about the Michigan Peddler or uh, you heard we were going to have Katie Dogovitz from the West, from the Detroit Public Library on the Oakland County Megacast and you missed that interview or you got to tune out now you got to go out and about do your thing be out in the community and you want to listen to the rest of our interviews civiccentertv.com slash megacast we got everything for you there we got full episodes that you can watch at your leisure short clips if you don't have a lot of time you want the most important information from each person and from each interview go ahead click on the short clips and we have all of those important most important moments from each show and each guest on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. And in addition, full interviews, the entire interviews. If you only want to listen to certain ones, go ahead. That's your pleasure. Go ahead and click on watch full interviews on civiccentertv.com slash megacast. And if you or someone else would make a great guest on our show, we love to hear from you. We always appreciate your suggestions. You can fill out our form here, the Talk to the Megacast team. Put your name, your email, uh, and who... Uh, what you want to talk to us about and your message for us and we will get that message and respond to you and maybe have you or someone else that you suggest on the show very soon. Tyler Keeft, this is the Oakland County Megacast. We'll take a quick break and we'll come back and in the and we're starting off the second hour of this Tuesday edition of the Megacast. We're starting it off real jazzy. I'll be speaking to Chris Collins from the Detroit Jazz Festival next. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV and radio stations. I'll return after this quick break with the second hour of the Oakland County Megacast. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's going to be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, Let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Heeft from the studios of 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV, our flagship stations here on the Megacast. Each and every day, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m., to 12 noon, Ronnie Dahl and I live from the studios here in at Green Media Center in West Bloomfield. Ronnie is not on the show today. She is out for the for the day, taking the day off. She will return tomorrow, and she and I have a number of great guests coming up for you on tomorrow's show. Definitely going to be a lot of focus on education, as we'll speak to Dr. Jerry Hill from the West Bloomfield School District and Dr. James Schwartz from the Avondale School District, as well as other interesting guests on the program on tomorrow's show. Today's show still has plenty of interesting people left to talk to today as we broadcast live on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99 on Civic Center TV and on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and broadcast live on the radio, 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake, West Bloomfield, Kegel Harbor, Sylvan Lake, that is 89.3 
Lakes FM live streaming online 24 hours a day, seven days a week at lakesfm.com as we talk during the Oakland County Megacast to a number of interesting guests from throughout Oakland County and the metropolitan area as well, including guests such as Chris Collins. Chris Collins is the president and artistic director of the Detroit Jazz Festival, and he now joins us live on the Oakland County Megacast. Chris, thank you for being with us today. Uh, the pleasure's mine, Tyler. Thanks for having me. Appreciate having you on. How are you, and how's everybody over at the Detroit Jazz Festival doing? We are cooking. As you know, the Detroit Jazz Fest Foundation is a year-round uh, organization with educational and performance programming. Our signature event, of course, the Detroit Jazz Festival, wrapped up early September uh, with great brava, our first uh, broadcast-only uh, Detroit Jazz Festival in 41 years. So it was quite a, quite a feat, but uh, everyone knows the reason why. Yeah, these virtual shows and these virtual festivals are certainly not easy to put on. Neither are the in-person ones, but they're arguably a little more complicated. Trying to get everyone's video and everyone's audio right, keeping everybody in sync, keeping things moving along. How was it different th this year for the Detroit Jazz Festival? Was the experience about the same? Was it a little bit different? What were the positives and negatives of the circumstances for which the Detroit Jazz Festival still went on in 2020? Well, you know, the Detroit Jazz Festival is a 41-year tradition in Detroit, the largest free jazz festival in the world. We attract about over 30, 300,000 uh, people in four days every year, uh, about a third of those from outside of the state. So it's a significant uh, piece of the culture and the uh, uh, and the Detroit legacy, as well as being a part of the Detroit jazz culture. Uh, but this year, you know, back in uh, back in uh, late March, early April, it was clear that uh, there were some things that needed to uh, to be uh, you know uh, reviewed, and uh, some decisions had to be made. I put together a task force uh, within the Festival Foundation, and we began to make relationships with health ex health experts and study the contingency possibilities of doing um, a very various versions of uh, the Detroit Jazz Festival. Uh, after some time, we did, um, we did have several uh, files uh, in place that we could use, um, although ultimately it became necessary to protect our patrons to make it a broadcast only non-live audience event. And then uh, as we move forward, there were some uplifts in, in uh, late June and July, and that caused us to also make some decisions about some of our out of town national artists, particularly those in um, situations where they may be uh, in a high risk category for the COVID-19. So uh, we looked at um, uh, you know those that were uh, elderly artists, African-American artists, those with secondary conditions, and we, we restructured the uh, program Programming. Uh, ultimately, I put in place a uh, broadcast only, and, and just to be clear, um, we we broadcast on uh, television, radio, and uh, and online um, for a couple of reasons. First is. Uh, uh, you know, it was a very high quality broadcast. We didn't want to do just a, a streaming sort of thing. We wanted to do something that uh, A, would raise the bar on audio and video quality uh, of, uh, of an online music festival event. And uh, also we wanted to make sure it was readily available to everyone, whether they had Wi-Fi or not, because we are a free festival. Part of our mission is to reach everyone. So our, um, our, our battle cry became uh, safe, live, and free. I insisted that all the performances be live, nothing pre-taped. So we ended up with four days, uh, a little over 12 hours a day of continuous jazz programming. You can imagine doing 12 hours of live television uh, in four different venues um, uh, throughout four days. It was quite quite an undertaking, but with the help of uh, folks at uh, DPTV and uh, all the infrastructure that we had created uh, with Detroit Jazz Fest Live, our online app uh, over the last uh, three and a half years, which included a lot of streaming elements, we were well suited uh, to put this together and had a lot of infrastructure in place. We ended up running, I think it was 2.8 miles of fiber optics. We built uh, four custom uh, sound stages at the um, Marriott and the Rensen um, and, uh, and developed uh, uh, an extremely um, uh, robust uh, uh, situation for audio, uh, video, and production, and of course, safety and isolation of the artists and our crew. In the end, we had over 400 people working on the site, and um, uh, thanks to uh, all concerned and uh, the very, the very intensive uh, safety protocols based on CDC and state uh, health guidelines, uh, we we weeks later we are without a single incident of covid uh in the uh jazz festival family so it was uh, very unique uh, very well very well uh, attended we had um 
as I said, about 10 uh, media outlets and um, the numbers are still coming in, but we were in uh, 32 countries worldwide, uh, nearly a million unique viewers and um, uh, certainly a wonderful ambassador program for Detroit and an incredible piece of the uh, jazz culture globally this year. Chris Collins with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the president and the artistic director of the Detroit Jazz Festival, which just completed its uh, 41st annual festival, do doing that entirely virtually over TV, over radio, over internet streaming, as he mentioned. And uh, Chris, you, me you mentioned all the collaborative efforts laying all that fiber optic, um, building customized st sound stages at the Rensen and at the Marriott as well. How much more this year with the circumstances that we're under and what had to happen in order to hold the 41st Detroit Jazz Festival, how much more of a community and a team effort did it become this year? And, and how is that indicative of everything that we're doing in our community and, and in the world right now to keep our society running? Well, like like everything else, um, uh, every year, particularly this year, it, it is very much a, a team effort. And it's the coming together of many, many different craftsmen and areas of craft throughout our region, uh, the um, IATSE Union of Stage Workers, crews, lighting, sound, um, of course, the incredible artistry that we bring in. It's, uh, it's always a large community effort. In this case, um, everyone had to pivot and direct their creativity and their wisdom and their craftsmanship at a completely different environment. You know, most festivals around the world, most, almost all, uh, canceled this year or postponed till next year. And uh, uh, it, what we, we, I wasn't boastful at all that we were the only one that survived. It was because, A, we don't rely on tickets. We rely on sponsors and donors. And secondly, we have this robust investment in, um, in, uh, in streaming and video technology already. And that put us in a good position to do it. But I have to really commend the incredible work of the Detroit Jazz Festival Foundation team and all of its um, uh, all of the vendors that we uh, employ in all the various different craft areas to pull it together. And uh, of course, along with uh, um, uh, broadcast professionals in production and direction and so on, these, these were uh, essential. In fact, it was somewhat reflected musically. The opening set of the festival was a piece um, I called Justice. And originally I was gonna just compose it uh, all four movements of this piece. It was inspired by the words of uh, the great John Lewis. But uh, I decided as we moved forward in the in the name of, of community effort and the beauty that that can present and the different perspectives that can bring, um, I ended up doing each movement uh, with a different Detroit ensemble and a different composer. And so in the end, you had all these different perspectives on the subject of justice, a very important subject this year and it really launched the festival with the sense of exactly what you're talking about we're all coming together to create a whole and in fact the feeling amongst the artists which uh, you're always uh, tentative when you go from live to to streaming um, or to broadcast you know the, this this maintaining the feeling of important performances and on stage how do you how do you use sound and lighting to create an environment for the artists that really feels special as a performance should. And we tended to all those issues. And uh, I can tell you that the artists who all stayed at the Marriott and the Renaissance, we created our own jazz bubble there of 400 and some people. Um, it was a feeling of, uh, of spiritual unity, of community and cultural unity, whether the artists were from Detroit or not. We all came together with a sense that we were doing something uh, for the greater good. We were bringing arts, culture, and jazz, a very important part of the Detroit scene, um, into our community in a time where it was very much needed and, and appreciated at a time when uh, much of that had disappeared from the landscape. And in fact, uh, the, day, the day I announced the lineup and we we're moving forward with the Detroit Jazz Festival 2020, uh, presented by Rocket um, Mortgage, by the way, uh, they um, I got a lot of feedback. It was on the same day as the governor uh, 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 proposed the lockdown. And a lot of the media came back and wanted to know why I would propose moving forward with such a huge event. And uh, my answer was simple. My answer was hope. We all need hope. We all need, uh, especially in the entertainment industry right now, an opportunity to look forward to potential uh, employment, which uh, you know is a lot of people when it comes to Detroit Jazz Fest Foundation. So I said, even if we canceled the day before the festival, a lot of people would go to work for the year and we would still find a way to get things done. In this case, 
um, things worked out uh, extremely well. And the feeling amongst the workers, the artists, the hotel, everyone was something very, very special. And I think that is uh, something we're all seeking. And I encourage everyone, be creative with uh, what you're doing now and look to the barriers that the situation presents as barriers to be overcome. And in many cases, and in our case as well, we see that uh, the barriers and the, the, the methods, the tools we use to overcome them will be things that we will employ in the future in new ways to expand into digital domains, to reach the broader audience of the world beyond uh, those that just make it to Detroit um, during the Detroit Jazz Festival. And it presents um, a whole new beautiful perspective on who we are and how we relate to our community and to the global community as a whole. Chris Collins with us, the president and artistic director of the Detroit Jazz Fe Festival, which just completed its 41st fe fest festival entirely virtually during this COVID-19 pandemic. And, and Chris, there's a great article in the Detroit News, and you touched on a little bit about the opening number of the Detroit Jazz Festival this year, uh, which centered around the theme of fighting for equality. In the year that we're in, with the experiences we've seen throughout the country, including in the Metro Detroit area, and even with the history of jazz being so heavily influenced by black Americans, by people of color uh, in America and all throughout the world, how important was it to incorporate that theme artistically, either as a way to reach people in a different way and, and help them understand what's being fought for on a national level through a different lens, and also to just continue to raise awareness, especially in the, the city of Detroit uh, and in the metro area, for this fight for equality. Yes, indeed, a very serious and ongoing issue. In fact, uh, you know, when, when Representative Lewis passed, I uh, took some time, as I, I often try to do when I can, to get to know uh, the person better. I, I uh, read his speeches and some of his writing and really uh, gained a, a, a perspective on who he was, the beauty of who he was, that he was, uh, you know, he, he was uh, uh, someone that was uh, uh, a representative of civil rights from the earliest days who suffered for it and yet uh, found a way um, to work through the system, to become part of the system and to make changes from within um, um, and and also always preaching the idea of um, of of carrying a message with um, you know with love, carrying the message with a, a spirit that is not a violent spirit, but one that gets the message across and makes changes happen. That being said, decades uh, after after uh, the civil rights movement began, you know he was still saying some of the same things that had not. Um, you know, moved, uh, the needle had not moved on some things in many ways. So that was a real inspiration. I will say um, uh, the, the, you know, jazz music uh, is a black music. I mean, the, the, the basis of jazz is, is African traditional rhythms and concepts. Those were, those were uh, distilled through the, the Latin countries and eventually came up um, to the Southern United States in, in, in New Orleans and, and some other places. And it became the basis of not only jazz, but of course, all American music. So the Detroit Jazz Festival Foundation, you know, we, we, uh, we made uh, statements about the Black Lives Matter movement and things on, on our media, uh, social media and website. But, but I, I, I took my time with that because I, I wanted to make it clear, you know, we weren't doing it uh, because we felt, you know, we, we, uh, we had uh, uh, just a, a need to do that to, to, to make a statement, but we had a responsibility because so much of the music that we love and support and our mission carries forward in education and performance is, um, uh, it, 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 you know, is, is about um, is about that population and that search, that 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 uh, uh, quest for true equality, true inclusion, and uh, diversity. Many of our programs, our open submission programs, our educational programs, they seek to make these things available to everyone. So, uh, you know, after the earlier stages of all this, I wanted to make sure we did and will continue to do some uh, very specific things that continue to support the concept, move it forward, speak to it, speak of it, bring, bring in different perspectives about it. So it's not just a statement on our webpage, but it is clearly 
us rising to the responsibility that we need to meet. And justice was exactly that, a musical representation from different perspectives of this important subject and an encouragement of all jazz artists to compose music that captures this. Put it in your repertoire. Keep the conversation going through your artistry, through what you can represent. And that uh, that was a very important part, not only of who we were this year, but who we always are and who we always will be. Chris Collins with us. He is the direct, the president and artistic director of the Detroit Jazz Festival with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Chris, uh, with everything that was experienced in the planning and execution of the 41st annual Detroit Jazz Festival in 2021, should COVID-19 not continue to have to be taking the toll that it is on the United States and on the state of Michigan, should we be able to get back to some sense of normalcy in the next year? How will the Detroit Jazz Festival's 42nd annual show be impacted by the, 20, the 41st annual show? What will be incorporated from what you did this year, possibly going forward in the future uh, in festivals, both in the 42nd and years beyond that? Yes, indeed. I mean, again, we were incredibly blessed that our amazing corporate sponsors, our presenting sponsor, uh, Rocket Mortgage and uh, many others, and our donors, individual donors, dug their heels in with us and knew this was an important year to stay with us and make this happen. I mean, that is essential and we will continue to work um, to, to celebrate that piece of who we are and how we're able to do what we do. These people are intrinsic parts of the community and, and uh, art all art, art, music, art, dance, uh, visual arts, they all require that philanthropic support to, to thrive without the pressures of, um, of commercialism dic dictating their direction so they can, they can uh, grow and thrive and evolve. Um, so that's an important piece. I will say that we all, um, as I said earlier, have to look to what we've learned in this year and potentially think about uh, how to use the, these new tools, these new crafts, these new infrastructures that we've created to expand in new directions, uh, to reach new audiences, new generations, new, demo, dem, new demographics around the world. How do, we, how do we approach that? How do we look to where we might not be meeting um, the need or the interest of certain demographics. For us, uh, we, we, uh, we have a Latino jazz outreach program because we noticed in some of our statistical analysis a few years ago that uh, the number of uh, Latinos at our events was, was low and we wanted to address that. So we've have a number of programs in place to do that. I mean, these are the kind of thoughts that come up when suddenly you have a global audience you can reach. That being said, then there's nothing that replaces great music face to face. And uh, there's no way that that will ever be replaced place but it can be enhanced and the delivery of live music to uh, either someone too far away to be here in person or someone who because of a physical disability can't leave their home um, all of these are places that we can now reach in sophisticated ways and uh, we can uh, as I said we we raise the bar on audio and video in order to establish um, a, a representation of how wonderful a broadcast music event can be it can be live it can be a extensive 12 hours a day and with the right people and the right format and the right team it can be pulled off with a plum and so all of these things will play into the future i would say we're all anxious to get back to face to face but without a doubt it has to be guided by data we're still working with uh, health professionals and watching data and helping to understand there's a lot of things we don't know we all are optimistic that there will be uh, changes in the near future but for us uh, our year-round programming which has already started the we this week alone wednesday through saturday we have a um uh, american standards to a taste of havana it's an all-star detroit group at the dirty dog jazz cafe we'll actually be streaming live on saturday uh the 24th and um i, I believe it's all the first set the 645 set is also simulcast on wdet these these things are taking place we're doing educational programs and everything we are now though planning everything to be virtual at this point and um watching for those opportunities where we might expand into a uh, a smaller 
audience, like at the club, it is a 50% audience. And when that can open up and when we can have other dimensions. But for sure, at this point, we're still in the world of COVID-19. We're still in the world of protecting patrons and artists. Specific safety protocols have to be kept intact. And very likely, moving forward, the world is going to be more sensitive to physical uh, contact and the kind of um, uh, protocols that we should all put into place to protect us all as individuals, as families, as communities, and as a global uh, a global group of human beings that need to um, be very sensitive to the fact that these viruses are here to stay and will only continue to evolve and be around. So with all that in mind, um, I think new formats are, um, are in order, new thoughts, new energies, new creativity in those directions. And I think you're gonna see the fruits of that as, as, uh, as, we, as we move forward, hopefully into a year, hopefully by spring, summer, where we're all attending those wonderful concert events that we love so much. But if not, there's a good reason and there's ways to do it that uh, will be valuable uh, for all of us and, and uh, something that will be uh, memorable uh, for the world. Chris Collins with us, the president and artistic director of the Detroit Jazz Festival. Chris, just another couple of minutes with you before we have to say goodbye. Is there anything else that would be important for our audience to know from the Detroit Jazz Festival or any other information that you would like our audience to know before we let you go today? Sure. Well, DetroitJazzFest.org, DetroitJazzFest.org. That's our website. Uh, we also have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter accounts. You can find us there. Um, we always give a shout out to our angel of jazz, the great Miss Gretchen Valade, who saved the festival some years ago and was behind the creation and the propagation of the Detroit Jazz Festival Foundation, along with uh, incredible, as I said, incredible sponsors from our presenting sponsor, Rocket Mortgage and Carhartt and Absol Pure and J.P. Morgan Chase and DTE Foundation, uh, and uh, and it, and uh, it goes it goes on and on, along with our incredible uh, independent donors. In fact, if you want to donate to the Detroit Jazz Festival, please go onto the website, hit that donate button, and you can be a part of the largest free jazz festival and year-round educational and performance uh, jazz initiative uh, emanating right here from our city of Detroit. I hope you take advantage of it. Keep our sponsors in mind; they make it happen. And uh, keep in mind our great angel of jazz, Gretchen Valade, who uh, is looking uh, over the entire jazz world and all of us and uh, making it special and growing Detroit's reputation for modern jazz. It's very special stuff. Well, Chris, thank you very much for being with us today. We appreciate having you on. My pleasure, Tyler. Thank you. Chris Collins, the president and artistic director at the Detroit Jazz Festival with us today on the Oakland County Megacast. Appreciate having them on. Really interesting stuff that they did for their 41st annual festival, entirely virtual. Uh, they did their own uh, jazz, jazz megacast, so to speak, on TV, on radio, and online. A very, very successful show and a great community effort. Uh, we appreciate Chris's time. We appreciate having him on to tell us about the story of the Detroit Jazz Festival in the COVID-19 pandemic. It still went on, great community effort, and uh, man, he sounded good. He sounded like he was right here in the studio with us. So I uh, definitely appreciate having him on and uh, previewing what may be to come at the 41st Detroit Jazz Festival. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we'll be talking about history with the Michigan History Center's Toby Vaught. That coming up and more, you're listening to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV and radio stations. I'll be back after this short break. I am Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, Turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now, 
it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. Ronnie Dahl is off today. She will return on tomorrow's edition of the Megacast. You can tune in to us each and every day, 10 a.m. to 12 noon, Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Both of those channels can be found, depending on your location, on Comcast Channel 15 and all throughout the local area on AT&T Channel 99 in their community television, government, and educa education and public access TV guide. That is on, on AT&T Channel 99. In addition, today, as always, 89.3 Lakes FM on the radio and on the Facebook page of West Bloomfield Parks. We appreciate Megan, Jennifer, and the entire team over at the Parks Department for joining us today on their Facebook page via Facebook Live. Go ahead, go there, give them a like, facebook.com slash WB Parks as we continue to talk to a number of interesting guests throughout the local area, including Toby Vaught, Community Engagement Director at the Michigan History Center, joining us now once again on the Oakland County Megacast. Toby, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Appreciate having you on. How is the team over at the Michigan History Center doing? We're doing well. We're adapting. We're coming up with some creative solutions and uh, uh, just keeping on. So a lot of museums and other public places, uh, the last time we spoke, were either just closing or had already closed, closed immediately in some cases. And now they're starting to reopen. Is that the case for the Michigan History Center? What is the status of, it, of its uh, openness to the community at this moment in time? Sure. So, um, so we are the state's uh, history institution. So we run uh, the Archives of Michigan in Lansing and 12 museums and historic sites across the state. And um, a lot of our historic sites were in state parks. And thankfully, we were able to open them in limited capacity quite a bit this summer. Uh, most of our sites are open seasonally, so they close around Labor Day. So most of those sites are closed now. Unfortunately, um, our kind of traditional museums, which are the Michigan History Museum, in the state capitol in Lansing, as well as um, our Michigan Iron Industry Museum, which is up uh, just near Marquette. Um, those are going to remain closed to the public at least through January 2nd at this time. Uh, we are all state employees and our governor has extended our work from home order for state employees through January 2nd at the minimum. And because of that, with us all working from home, we, are, we don't have the ability to open up our, our uh, facilities to the public at this time, unfortunately. So in the meantime, Toby Vaught, Community Engagement Director at the Michigan History Center, what programming is available through the History Center to the general public? Are there virtual programs available and uh, what may those entail? Sure, yes, we are really ramping up. We've been um, experimenting, trying to uh, figure out how to do this because uh, as since we are working from home, we don't uh, necessarily have access to our facilities ourselves, which makes doing things like live virtual tours a little bit of a challenge, but we're working through those. Uh, in the meantime, we really have started uh, creating some uh, workshops and webinars. In fact, we've got a series going on right now. October is Family History Month. So for those uh, genealogists or folks who've gotten into it because uh, you've had some time here to work on some ancestry, uh, our archives staff and our archivists are um, are experts in doing family research, particularly in um, particular state and government records. So they're doing a series of workshops every Wednesday in October. Um, the workshops are free if you're a member of the Michigan History Center and membership starts at $50. So if you, um, 
you know, go onto our website, become a member, you'll, you'll be able to access these for free. The, the next workshop is actually happening tomorrow, um, and it is particularly a focus on how to do research in corrections records, so records from um, state prisons and other um, uh, containment type facilities. Toby Vaught joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. She is the Community Engagement Director at the Michigan History Cent Center with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Um, at this time, it's, uh, in my notes, I also see that the Michigan History Center is giving some tours. Who are they available to? How are they available? Where are they available? And what do those tours entail? Sure. So we have a lot of digital resources when we um, that are available on our website and on a, a few channels. And we do have a kind of a, an interesting collection of tours of some of our sites. Um, and they're all a little different. Like uh, if you wanted to do a walkthrough of the Michigan History Museum, which is really, you know, tells the history of our entire state. Um, we do have a 360 uh, web-based tour that you can actually get into a VR and walk around the museum, or you could go to our website and just walk around the museum and see all the sites. So that's available. We also have um, different groups. Well, one of our museums is a historic house museum, and it's just celebrating its 50th anniversary of being a museum. It's the Man House. It's in Concord near Jackson. And uh, to commemorate that, they have created a tour video that you can access. Um, most all of our video content is based on our Vimeo page, which is really easy to get to. It's just vimeo.com slash Michigan history. And once you get there, you'll be able to access a lot of our tour content, a lot of our um, history content that staff have been working on and developing since we closed in March. Toby Vaught with us. She is the Community Engagement Director of the Michigan History Center. Joining us today on the Oakland County MegaCast. Uh, Toby, what are some of the future plans for the History Center as you continue to have your shutdown until the governor's either reversed her work at home order for those employees of, of the Michigan History Center and for the state that runs through January 2nd of next year? And, and as programming continues to be virtual and need to be varied to attract people back, are there, what are some of the plans for events that are coming up in the future that maybe people should keep an eye out for or mark their calendars for as well? Yeah, we're really excited about this. I think, you know, we, like most other people, we've been very flexible, kind of moving on a week to week basis with our plannings, not really having, um, not knowing at any given moment if we were going to be able to reopen. So we have been really focusing on those plans on how to reopen safely. But now that we know that it'll be another few months before we reopen, it's, it's giving us a little bit of space to get together and a team of all of us, you know, our historians, our curators, our public programming, our community engagement staff, we're all getting together to kind of make some bigger plans for what our digital content's gonna look like. And I think things you'll expect, like for me, one of our priority is, you know, we usually serve 65,000 elementary school students come to see the State Museum when they visit the Capitol every year. And obviously that's not a possibility. And we've got a lot of great content in our museum that can help educators, you know, teach Michigan and US history. So we're gonna be focusing now that we can get into our building and, and uh, we're gonna be focusing on creating probably to start some very short form videos that teachers can use in their virtual or in-person classroom. Um, and then uh, we would love to be able to get to some virtual live tours with classrooms. So we are quickly learning how to do that and um, testing our bandwidth in our galleries and things like that. So that, that's a big push for us. But I think you'll also see we're gonna be um, creating a lot more uh, webinars and, and meetings and things that enable us to share some of the, the rich history content we have. We were supposed to open an exhibition uh, this summer called I Voted uh, Michigan's Struggle for Suffrage, um, which kind of talks about voting rights throughout Michigan's history. And we're really looking to um, take a lot of that content and turn it into a series of you know Zoom-based presentations. So um, I think in the next uh, few weeks, you'll start seeing a lot more of these, these offerings that will be We'll be putting out. We're joined by Toby Vaught. She is the Community Engagement Director at the Michigan History Center with us on the Oakland County Megacast all throughout the local area on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99 on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and Civic Center TV on the radio on, on 89.3 Lakes FM and on Facebook via Facebook Live. 
with West Bloomfield Parks. Facebook.com slash WB Parks. Toby, just a few more minutes with you today. If people want to find more information uh, on the Michigan History Center or if they want to engage in some of the local programming, ask questions about it, how can they best go about doing so? Sure. Well, a good place to always start is our website. It's michigan.gov slash MHC. Um, another great place where we put a lot of our digital content is if you're on Facebook, um, we're just facebook.com slash Michigan History Center. Um, you'll find information about all of our upcoming events. Plus, we like to post, um, you know, Throwback Thursday photos and a lot of fun like that. We also do that on Instagram, which is, again, Michigan History Center, if you search us, and Twitter. So we are on the social platforms. And then if you really want to take a dive into a bunch of videos, um, early on, our staff all created videos of us cooking historic recipes in our kitchen, which are a lot of fun. I made a jello mold that consists of salmon and hard boiled eggs. So that's a fun video to watch. You can catch that on our Vimeo channel, which again is vimeo.com slash Michigan history. Toby Vaught with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Toby, just another minute or so with you before we have to let you go. Is there anything else that would be important for our audience to know from the Michigan History Center, interesting for our audience to know from them as well, or anything else that you'd like to discuss today that we haven't touched on yet? I just want to say that, yeah, you know, COVID has been a, a big game changer for museums across the country, and particularly for us, you know, my role is community engagement director. And as you know, we don't have historic sites or museums in Oakland County or even Wayne or Macomb County. So I think what makes me really excited is being a um, Oakland County resident from birth. So that's my, you guys are my hometown, um, is being able to, for the first time, really offer exciting programs and reach to communities that we haven't been able to serve physically with brick and mortar museums, but but um, really excited about the opportunities that virtual connection is gonna bring us. And it's something that we're gonna incorporate into our regular schedule of events, even when you know we're allowed to go back, this, this passes and we're all back in the museum. It'll be exciting. So I'm really looking forward to building some connections and relationships with people in Oakland County and Southeast Michigan that we just have not had the opportunity to do in the past. Well, Toby, we appreciate having you on today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Toby Bott with us, the Community Engagement Director at the Michigan History Center with us today on the Oakland County Megacast. Appreciate having her on once again for an update from the Michigan History Center. Their museums still, for the most part, are closed. Their traditional sites that are on state park locations, of course, closed right around Labor Day. So for the most part, their museums are closed, but their programming continues online, their virtual programming and even some other digital resources and museum tours that can be done virtually as well. So there's plenty of uh, programming and plenty of content from the Michigan History Center. We encourage you, uh, if you have a moment and want to learn a little bit more about our state's great history, to visit them uh, and their virtual space. We're going to take a quick, quick break. We'll come back. We'll go over today's top headlines, and then we'll cap off today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast, talking to the president and CEO of the Belle Isle Conservancy. You are watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on Civic Center TV. Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 89.3 Lakes FM, and the Facebook page of West Bloomfield Parks. The Oakland County Megacast returns in just a few. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards. Back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, Talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one. Turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, Turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. 
Go to oakgov.com slash health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 89.3 Lakes FM, and online on Facebook via Facebook Live, facebook.com slash West Bloomfield, slash WB Parks, facebook.com slash WB Parks. It's the Facebook page of West Bloomfield Parks. We appreciate their entire team over there for joining us today, our Facebook partner on this edition of the Oakland County Megacast. So what do we do each day? We're not just a regular radio broadcast or TV broadcast, not just a news show, not just a talk show. We're a little bit of everything, and we put ourselves in a position to be on every single possible outlet we can be on to bring you the local news that you need to know in your community in Oakland County and the greater area about COVID-19 and other important information as well. And one of the ways we do that is on our website on civiccentertv.com. So if you go to our website on our homepage, you'll have, of course, each and every day we'll have our episode and our most important clips of the day right there at your convenience. In addition, you can go to civiccentertv.com slash megacast and watch all of our programming on demand as you wish. If you want to watch a full episode but you can't tune in 10 a.m. to 12 noon and you can't tune in at 5 o'clock or 8 o'clock for replays or preempted by a meeting or some other situation that doesn't afford you to watch us at our regular times, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Click on our full episodes and it'll open a new tab and here you go. Here's our episode from Monday, from last week Friday and Thursday and so on and so forth at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. In addition, short clips. If you only have a few minutes, you want the most important information, you can get our short clips from our website as well and watch full interviews. If you only have time for a couple interviews and you want the most interesting ones, the most important interviews with uh, guests that you want to hear from, you can also watch them anytime online on demand on civiccentertv.com. And you can find the latest news and information while we're on the show and while we're not on the show on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Information from reputable resources from the state, the federal government, from Oakland County, and from many of our local municipalities in our coverage area regarding COVID-19. These are their direct COVID-19 pages. So if you live in the city of Birmingham, you can go to, you can click on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast, select Birmingham, and there you go. It takes you directly to Birmingham's COVID-19 specific webpage. You don't have to dig through your city's website to find that information. You just go to our website, click on megacast, click on, uh, click on coronavirus, click on Birmingham, and it takes you right there. Three easy steps that you, are, that you can remember and go for instead of digging through the entire website. And we have our top headlines of the, of the day. And today, good news for some small business owners in the local area. Huntington has announced that it is launching a new program called Huntington Lift Local Businesses that will offer loans to small businesses that have suffered financial hardships as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The loans are expected to range from the low end of about $1,000 to $5,000, otherwise known as micro loans, to upwards of $150,000. Uh, and these, these will enable struggling startups to continue their business despite the financial toll of the past seven months and even inspire entrepreneurs to invest in their own ideas or 
kickstart an already great idea or budding business that's been waiting for a spark during this pandemic. Those that are interested in applying for these loans will qualify even with a lower credit score of 580 or above, and the loans will have a repayment option, will have repayment options that are flexible and long-lasting so that you're not expected to pay back these loans in a short period of time if you need to stretch them out. Uh, you'll be able to do that. So another great loan program. This is, of course, from a private institution as opposed to our, one of our local governments uh, through Oakland County, through the CARES Act, through the state of Michigan, and, of course, through the federal government that continues to be in negotiations of further supplemental uh, relief aid to states such as ours and the entire union uh, as the Democrats and Republicans in Washington, D.C. continue to argue as they do best. More news on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Michigan records nearly 3,000 new COVID cases over the weekend. Don't be alarmed. Those are Saturday and Sunday numbers being reported on Monday. 2,909 new cases and 21 deaths over the weekend. The new, the new cases average is now at its highest point since early April. While Michigan's testing numbers have remained stagnant at about 30,000 per day, the positive rate from those tests has risen to about 4% as of late with the state's fatality rate for COVID-19 settling in at 4.8%. As of Monday's updated numbers, the state of Michigan has reported 147,086 novel coronavirus cases and 7,031 7 deaths from COVID-19. As it continues to take a toll on our state, we're in a little bit of a spike. We, need, we definitely could use being a little bit more careful, especially as we await further instructions from our state legislature and the governor as they collaborate to adjust now the governor's previous executive orders that have been uh, ruling how we are addressing COVID-19 were struck down by the Michigan Supreme Court in a 7-0 to zero vote and a subsequent 4-3 to three vote that made those changes immediate instead of a 21-day expiration period. More news, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. COVID-19 causes fewer drivers to be on Michigan roads, but traffic deaths are increasing. Over the past seven months and counting of the COVID-19 pandemic, workers have remained at home, schools have been closed, people aren't going out as much, so there's a reduced, so there's a reduced number of cars on the road. This may have led to fewer commutes and less non-essential travel, but it's, caused, but it's also experienced an increase in traffic-related deaths. According to the Detroit Free Press', Press and Nisa Khan's article reporting that according to the state police, 2020 has brought upon more vehicle deaths to date than the same period up to this point in 2019. Among the p potential culprits of these increased deaths are speeding, tailgating, and not wearing seatbelts. Uh, it's only an increase of 12 deaths between January 1st and September, 19, September 20th of 2019 and that same period in this year. But... Uh, but the state police are saying that uh, if we're not careful, that number, that difference could continue to inflate as we go forward. So, yes, there's less cars on the road, less often, there's less traffic, and your commutes may be shorter. That's certainly not a reason to speed, definitely not a reason to tailgate, and you should wear your seatbelt for your safety and the safety of others as well. Lastly, on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus if you're planning on going to Canada anytime soon, especially through the rest of October and through November 21st, well, I, don't have so, I have some bad news for you. Canada has extended its non-essential U.S. travel ban through November 21st. Canada elected to extend the moratorium on non-essential American travel across the border as the COVID-19 pandemic prolongs itself beyond the seven-month period. The Canadian border will remain closed to such non-essential travel until November 21st, as was announced on Monday by the Canadian Public Safety Minister, the great Bill Blair. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, in a radio interview recently, indicated that his desire is to keep the border closed until the pandemic is under control, as written in, this, in the Bloomberg article by uh, Kate Bolangero, posted on the Detroit News' website. Canada travel restrictions on the undefended border to the United States began in March as the pandemic began to take a toll on North America. Although, on, although unnecessary travel or non-essential travel remains banned for the time being, Canada does permit some necessary travel between the two countries 
for commerce, among other reasons. So if you're planning a trip to Canada, you're probably not going to be able to do so for at least the entire month of November, the rest of the month of October. And I would presume that much like, uh, much like how states of emergency have continued on throughout this pandemic uh, before, of course, the governor's orders were struck down by the Michigan Supreme Court, I would, ex I would expect Canada to continue this non-essential travel ban over the border to the United States uh, for the time being, probably indefinitely. We'll see this month to month. We saw it last month. We saw it the month before. So once again, Canada extending its non-essential travel ban to and from the United States through November 21st of 2020 and likely will go on far beyond that. That and more on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, your home for reputable resources directly from the sources for COVID-19. If you want information from the federal government, we have the website for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's COVID-19 resources right there. Learn more about how to properly wear a mask. Should it be over your nose? Should it be over your chin? Spoiler alert, the answer is yes. Uh, how do you fit a mask to you? How do you, best fit, how do you best choose what mask is right for you in what situation? How can you protect yourself from COVID-19? You can get those questions answered at the CDC's website without digging through all the information that's there in a very complicated website to get to their COVID-19 page. All you got to do is click on CDC resources on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. In addition, if you want updates from the state of Michigan about what's going on with our response to COVID-19 as the legislature and the governor have to work on adjusting to tag teaming in fighting the coronavirus from the government level. You can go to our website, click on the Michigan State of Michigan resources, and it'll take you directly to the Michigan government website regarding COVID-19, including information about the My Safe Schools roadmap. Uh, so you can reference that if you're speaking to your local school district, whether that be in West Bloomfield, Bloomfield Hills, Birmingham, Waterford, Wald Lake, or other sc school districts in the West Bloomfield area. Or your, or your local school district outside of our area, if you're one of those listening outside of Greater West Bloomfield, Oakland County, or even, um, or even southeastern Michigan, we appreciate you joining us as well on the show. CivicCenterTV.com slash coronavirus. And you can find more information as we talk to health officials, as we talk to government officials, and more on CivicCenterTV.com slash megacast. And in addition... Learn information on our partnering organization. So you can find more information on 88.1 The Biff, a great radio station out of Bloomfield Hills that's usually been with us. Some technical issues we're working through right now and hope to have them back with us on our live shows very soon. Learn more about Birmingham Area Municipal Access as well and 89.3 Lakes FM. And if you're interested in learning about our Facebook partner, West Bloomfield Parks, a couple of options for you. Facebook.com slash WB Parks or WB Parks dot org as, we, as well. You can learn more about West Bloomfield Parks events coming up and uh, and find some of their other live programming that they do via Facebook Live, including uh, including uh, when they have outdoor time with Lauren Missouri, the parks naturalist. It's basically like our version, like their version, uh, shorter version of our Minute with Nature program with Lauren Missouri. She does a great job. We're going to take a quick break. We'll return. We'll go through some of the most important information from our guests so far this week and wrap up the show. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV and radio stations, 89.3 Lakes FM. Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, and the Facebook page of West Bloomfield Parks. We'll return after this short break. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards. Back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, Talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. 
Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. All right. Do you like free stuff? Do you, do you like learning information, having experiences that are fun and not having to pay a single dime for them? Wow, boy, do I have a great event for you that's coming up in the West Bloomfield area. We'll be broadcasting live parts of it as, as well uh, next week, Wednesday and Thursday, October 28th and October 29th. It is the first annual West Bloomfield Vibe event brought on by a number of community partners, including, of course, the Greater West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce hosting the event. We're co-hosting with them at Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM, as well as Motown Digital, as well as Motown Digital. Some great other community partners, such as the Orchard Mall, Beaumont, Henry Ford, West Bloomfield Hospital, Consumers Energy, Comcast, and the Health Alliance Plan, as well. What is this event? Well, here we go. Vibe.MotownDigital.com, where you can register for this free event and attend this free event. For, it's a virtual community event that brings business leaders, health experts, social media gurus, entertainment, and a whole lot of surprises to the next level. It's a community-wide event. You can learn more about the programs and events that will happen at the West Bloomfield Vibe. Learn more about the Greater West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce. Why are we doing this in West Bloomfield? Why right now? Learn that more. And, of course, register for this event. Like I said when I came in to, op to open this segment, it's free. So if you like free stuff... If you like free contests, if you like free music and entertainment, if you want to learn information from business experts, from social media experts, from health experts for free and, get, and talk to them as well, get some free advice, October 28th, October 29th, vibe.motowndigital.com. I'm all fired up about it. I'm excited. I'm going to go register for this the moment I get off of the show today in just a few minutes at 12 noon. We'll be involved in that. It's going to be a really fun event. And we're even going to have some music from local musicians, including our good friends Byron and Michelle Conselmo from the Byron Legacy Show and, of course, the Byron in Motion Band as well, who were on the show with us yesterday right around this time and told us what we can expect to hear from them at the first West Bloomfield Vibe Conference next week, October 28th and October 29th. 29, here are Byron and Michelle teasing that upcoming performance you'll hear next week. We'll provide, you know, a wide range of mix, you know, Dua Lupa, Bee Gees, um, Marvin Gaye, uh, maybe some Blondie, some Tom Jones, some Neil Diamond, some Karen Carpenter, you know, kind of give you a little um, experience from the, you know, the, the, the pop stars from yesteryears to today's pop stars. And of course, the classic rock era, and we are in Detroit, so we definitely gonna do some Motown. Everyone likes disco, so we've been working on a uh, What's that song from uh, Bee Gees? Oh, I mean, we've done a lot of Bee Gees. I'm not Nights sure. on Broadway. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the groove in that song is just infectious. So we're going to definitely, uh, we're going to get into it. And we're going to, uh, we got a subwoofer. Yeah, be, it's fun to have something nice, on uh, the calendar. Powerful and... speakers. And we'll get into it as much as we possibly can. And, um, you know, my understanding, it, it's going to be, um, there'll be a, a small audience, you know, a social distance audience. So that's going to be exciting. It's going to be a very exciting show. Uh, and not just, not just Byron and Michelle Conselmo. We'll also have, uh, I don't want to get you too excited too early for this, but you definitely want to go pre-register because you're also going to hear Steve Acho. Yes, Steve Acho. We've had him on the show recently as well. Another great West Bloomfield musician. 
and we'll also have some local celebrities as well. If you want to hear more about some of those local celebrities you might see and hear at the West Bloomfield Vibe next week, I encourage you to tune in on Friday night, 6.30 p.m. for the pregame show, 7 o'clock for the football game. West Bloomfield taking on the Lake Orion Dragons live from the swamp at West Bloomfield High School. We'll have it for you right here, 89.3 Lakes FM, right here, Civic Center TV and civiccentertv.com. And it'll also be on Facebook Live on the West Bloomfield School District's Facebook page as well. Tune in. You'll hear more about Vibe. You'll get to watch a great football game, a rematch of a quadruple overtime game from last season in which West Bloomfield won on the second day of football, 59-52. to 52. So that's a big matchup coming up. You're definitely not going to want to miss that game. You can watch it and listen, it, and listen to it live, Civic Center TV, Lakes FM, the Facebook page of the West Bloomfield School District. That's going to be great, as will the West Bloomfield Vibe event next week, Wednesday and Thursday, October 28th and October 29th, vibe.motowndigital.com to register. That's going to do it for today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. For our entire team, Jake Kustash, our booking producer, Larry Nyland, our Zoom producer, my usual co-host, Ronnie Dahl, who will return tomorrow. I am Tyler Keeft saying goodbye. Have a good day. You have been listening to the Oakland County Megacast.